All right. So hi guys. First off, let me say thanks so much for the overwhelming responses that um I've gotten from the revision videos. Um, I had no idea you all would have appreciated it that much, but I'm really glad that I did go forward um, with the idea and make it. And I was really, really happy to see how many students it helped and, you know, how confident um, a lot of students were after. And also some um, people came back after to tell me how the exam was. So I really, really, really appreciated that. So I didn't even think about doing the um, paper tree prep, but a few persons reached out and asked, and you know, why not? If I already did the revision for paper two, I might as well do the paper three, right? So um, there's only two topics that they listed, which was um, like the food and nutrition, and uh, I believe terrestrial environment right so we all know for food and nutrition it's always based on like food tests so that's what you need to know for sure for sure the food tests you may need to know some procedures because they can ask you to write a procedure um what are some of your limitations why you need this reagent or what does this do um or they could give you it in a table form and you have to either fill in what the results would be if it's a positive test or a negative test and um, or you may have to put in um, the procedure to do it in the table so either way you have to know on um, your food test the results for both a positive and negative test and the procedures for all of the food tests and then with the environment, um, the terrestrial environment, um, most likely that would be based on soils. So um, I guess the what I'm looking for is a disclaimer, but I've never done um, paper three for integrated science before. And I don't have the list of, um, the list of topics that you all would do um, for the labs, right? But based on um, the few past papers I have for paper three and what I was able to source, um, from what I'm seeing, well, yes, for the food tests, but for the terrestrial environment, I'm mainly seeing things based on soil, right? And also from the syllabus, that's why I went and um, I used that to see what labs were recommended in the syllabus. Um, for the terrestrial environment and that's what I saw I saw soils so that's what I'm going on or based on so if I forgot anything or let's say if um, they usually bring things on the food chain or food webs and other sources or not sources but other topics you can feel free to leave a comment below and I'll just um, do our next video to update this that I already have okay so that's enough of me talking. I'm sure by now you all realize that as well talk. But it's for a reason, right? I just need, I just find you know I need to explain myself. So anyway, all right. So let's get into it. So the first thing we want to do is the food test. And I have what we need to do here. So we have to use some qualitative reagents to test for a range of carbohydrates, lipids, and proteins um, using different tests. So you know the main carbohydrates we look for are our reducing sugars. Reducing sugars are always monosaccharides, or not always, but most of them are monosaccharides. So that would be, for example, um, glucose or fructose, right? It's just one single unit and it's not bound to anything else. So those would be our um, our non reduced sorry our reducing sugars, and that is what we are looking for based on the food test requirements. So for most of them, or 
almost all of the tests that you'll need to do, you first have to prepare the sample. So to prepare the sample, that means that you have to break up the food samples using um, laboratory equipment, right? So you have the, um, the pestle and mortar. You have to use test tubes. You want to use distilled water. Um, you also want to have things like droppers, um, filter paper, a funnel, maybe some beakers, um, because you have to prepare a water bath. Um, for sure, a Bunsen burner, the tripod stand, and the wire and mesh to put the um, beaker on. Um, also, a thermometer, right? So I didn't write out the list of things that you would need, but those are the items um, that you would need for some of the tests going forward. And of course, the samples that you'll be using to test and the reagents that you'll be using. So first, you'll need to break up your food samples using the pestle and mortar. So you crush it and then you transfer it to a test tube and I add some distilled water to it. So the reason you're adding distilled water to it is to get into the third step where you mix it by shaking for a few seconds. Um, you shake vigorously and then you filter the mixture using a funnel and filter paper to collect the solution. So what we want is the liquid um, from this food sample that we just crushed. And the reason why you have to crush your food samples is because remember, for example, if we're looking for glucose, all of the materials that we're looking for are within the cells. So to get the material, to get any sort of positive test or to see if it's there, you'd have to crush the food samples to crush or to break the cells for the contents to be released. And the contents that is being released this is where it's going to be in the solution. So that's why we're collecting that. And that's what we're going to do the test on. Now for the iodine test, um, especially like if it's with testing for starch in the leaf, you know, you just prepare the leaf and then you put the iodine on the um, leaf itself. Or like if you have some sort of food sample, um, let's say potato, you just put the a few drops of the iodine on it. So not all of the materials that you'll be using, you have to crush, but most of them you have to, okay? So based on what they tell you for the exam, um, if they actually give you a list of things that you have to use um, to make up your procedure, you will determine or you will have that discretion of choosing whether you want to crush the material or whether it's something like a potato where you could just put a few drops on it. So now we could proceed to doing the food tests. So we have some in um, common or the general food tests that we would do. And it's the same thing you do for biology, right? Because again, this is the biology part of integrated science. Integrated science has a bit of everything. You get the biology, the physics, as well as the chemistry. So the first test is the Benedict's test. And we use the Benedict's test to test for reducing sugars. And as I said, this would be mainly our monosaccharides. So for example, we're going to be testing for glucose, right? So the first thing you want to do, or um, I guess how I should say it for you to remember, most of the food tests is very simple. You don't have to do no big set of prep in terms of setting up. Um, a water bath and all of these things. However, the Benedict's test, this is the one where you have a bit of work to do before you could see anything. So for the Benedict's test, you have to prepare the water bath. So first you set up the water bath, then you add um, the food samples that test you with a few drops of the Benedict solution. Then you put the test tubes in the water bath for five minutes and you note any color change. So in your procedure, you could actually put, um, if you want to sh um, stir it for a little while or swirl it, right, to mix properly, you can put that. 
And then the last thing I put here is just a key point that if it remains blue, then it's a negative test. So this is the picture here we could follow off of. We have um, all of the apparatus that we need here. So we have the tripod stand or any sort of stand. We have the Bunsen burner here. We have the beaker, the water inside of the beaker, the thermometer, and the test tubes. Now, um, based on what they tell you in the exam, you, um, you will know if you have to do more than one um, test tubes, if you have more than one samples to check with, or if it's just one, it's just preparing one um, sample here, right? So you have the first thing here. So you light or you put on the Bunsen burner, you set it up, you set the water back. You want to have the water about 80 um, degrees Celsius. So we want to check with the thermometer to make sure it's at the temperature that we want it at. And remember, if the temperature goes above, you simply add some cold water um, bit by bit until it goes back to the point where you want it to get to, point being the temperature. So you have the um, sample that we prepared initially, and you add a few drops of that Benedict solution. So the Benedict solution is this color here, right? It's going to be this blue color. And then when you add it to the water bath, after a while, if there is reducing sugars in the sample, you are going to see color change. And these here indicate the color changes that you would notice. So if it remains blue after this initial five minutes that you gave it, then it's a negative test. However, if it changes into any of these colors going down here, then it's a positive test, right? So the color does not indicate what is the reducing sugar it just indicates the amount of reducing sugar in the sample so from here it will be a little bit then you'll have a moderate amount and then if it turns into this brick red color at the end here then you know in the sample there's a high concentration of the reducing sugar in the sample that is all the colors tell you so Anything apart from this original color blue here is a positive test. So all three of these are positive tests. It just the color is just indicating the concentration of the reducing sugar in the sample. So simple enough. Um, your wording, it doesn't have to be the same as mine. Um, you just put your words however you want to for your procedure if you have to write it out but just make sure you have your key points you need to have the water bath and talk about the equipment that you have to use along the way okay then we have a very simple test the iodine test iodine is used to test for starch so you have the food sample that we had prepared before or as i had mentioned um if it's like potato or like you're seeing they have some crackers here um if it's things like this, then you could just put a few drops on it. So depending on what it is, you would know if you have to prepare the sample before or not. So anyway, you add a few, um, you add some of the food sample to the test tube, then you add a few drops, probably like two or three drops of iodine, and you wait. You swirl a little bit and you wait to see any color change. Now, if it remains this color here, which is sort of reddish orange color. Like if you could notice the color of the um, iodine solution in this dropper here, you'll notice that it's sort of orangish brown, right? If it remains this color, which is the original color of the iodine, then this is a negative test. So that would mean that whatever um, sample you were using or sample that you were testing doesn't have any starch in it. But if it turns into this color or this color that it has here, so the same thing, that um, very dark blue-black color, 
then this indicates a positive test and it is telling you that your sample contains starch in it. Next one, we have the emulsion test for lipids. With the emulsion test for lipids, we are using, we have to prepare the sample, right? We did that initially. So you add the food sample to the test tube, then you add a few drops of distilled water and a few drops of ethanol. Ethanol is what we are using here. This is our reagent for this um, test. So after you add the ethanol, you shake the solution gently and then you note any change that you're seeing. And again, this point here, if it's clear, then that, um, if the solution is clear after shaking it and adding the ethanol and everything, then that's a negative test, meaning that your sample doesn't have any fats or any lipids in it. So this here um, basically breaks it down. So you have here, you have the ethanol in the bottle and you have the um, test tube with the food sample at the bottom and you add the distilled water and a few drops of the ethanol, then you shake it and you wait to see what um, the results would be. So generally, if you get a milky sort of um, emulsion here, emulsion, emulsion test, that's where you get the name from. So if you notice this, this is um, a realistic picture of what you'll see. If you notice this change here, then that's a positive test. So these two here, those are positive tests. This one here where it remains clear, that's a negative test. So that means there are no lipids in your sample. Um, apart from this test, there's a next one that you can do, a very, very simple one, a grease proof paper. Now that one, it would be for um, samples that actually like emit the oil. So for example, cheese. If you have grease proof paper and you rub a piece of cheese or fried chicken or something on it, you know for a fact you'll see that grease stain on it where um well you'll notice the change right you'll see that's on a translucent piece um coming on that spot on the grease proof paper so that's a very simple test but you don't really use that one or they don't really mention that one for the exams it's more so the emulsion test here where you have to use the ethanol right and uh, the last one we have the burette test where we're using this test to test for protein so again we have the prepared food sample you add that to the test tube then you add a few drops of the burette solution to the test tube or so pay close attention to this or here because in some of the um papers in the exam scripts they don't just say the burette solution they actually have this here and i think um the paper that we'll do after this is what they have right so they have two cm cubes you're adding two cm cubes of potassium hydroxide and two drops of copper sulfate solution so whether it is burette solution or the potassium hydroxide and the two drops of copper sulfate this is for the burette test where you are testing for proteins so if you are doing or writing your procedure if it is the simplest way for you to remember um, is by saying the burette solution then you do so if it's easier for you somehow to remember potassium chloride and two drops of copper sulfate then you write that but please know the both of them just in case you get the table and they have either or so just know the both of them is for the beer um the beer test for proteins right and you give it a little swirl and you note any color change so this one here again if it remains blue then that indicates a negative test so here same thing that a light blue color sort of like um, that of the um, 
Benedict's test, but the Benedict's test or the Benedict solution has a sort of darker color, right? But either way, if it remains blue, then this is a negative test. There is no protein in your sample. But if it turns this sort of purple lilac color here, then that's a positive test and your sample contains protein in it. So just as a summary of all the tests, we have the iodine test for starch, we have the Benedict's test for reducing sugars. Please remember it is reducing sugars. Um, you have ethanol for the lipids and you have the burette test for protein. So what's the color of the reagents? The iodine is originally orange brown. The Benedict's um, solution is light blue. The ethanol is colorless and the burette solution is, um, sorry, the burette reagent is blue, right? So both the Benedict's and the burette reagent is blue in color. Now, if you get a positive test for the iodine, then that means it turned blue black in color. If you got a positive test with the Benedict solution, then it went anywhere from green to yellow to orange um, to that brick red. And remember, as I said, those four colors, all of them indicate a positive test, but um, the more intense the color is going from that green to the brick red, it is just showing the concentration of the, um, the reducing sugar that is present in the sample. Then if you get a positive test with the ethanol, then you get that cloudy emulsion. And lastly, with the burette test, if you get a positive result, then it's going to turn a lilac or poop. Um, that's not a lilac purple color. But if you get negative tests for the eye, um, negative results with the iodine it's going to remain remain orange brown with the benedicts it's going to remain light blue with the ethanol it's going to remain colorless and with the burette it's going to remain blue all of them is going to be the original color of the reagents there's going to be no change so that's it for that part with the food test um You'd notice that I didn't really put like 5 cm cubes of the sample and all of that. You make sure and put that, okay? Because when you're giving your procedure, the, um, remember it's instructions that you're given for an experiment that you would have been doing, right? Or that you're instructing or given instructions for, sorry. So you want to make sure and put the amount. So if it's 5 cm cubes of sample, um, two drops of the reagent, you want to make sure and put that. And there's no right and wrong amount, but just make it realistic. You're never going to put 100 cm cubes of the sample in a beaker and then add a bottle of reagent. That doesn't make any sense, right? So make it realistic. So I would say about 5 cm cubes and two drops, so depending on what it is around that 3 to 5, or maybe a little more than that, um, but five standard, that's like the um, maximum amount that I would actually put if I was actually writing out the procedure for the lab, okay? So you do the um, questions for that in a little bit. Let's just do the last part. So terrestrial environments. So this part here, as I said, I don't usually do the um, paper three for integrated science, so I don't have all of the labs um, that they would usually do. But based on what I saw in the um, the syllabus, you know, they tell you what experiments or what labs you're supposed to do according to the topic, right on the side. This is what I saw. So they had the sedimentation test. Um, you want to do the percentage or investigate the percentage of air, the pH of soil, drainage, water retention, and know how to um, have the label diagrams of soil profiles. This is the same thing that they would do for biology, right? So I'm assuming that it would be the same. 
remember, as I said in the beginning, if I missed out anything um, that you know you had to prepare for this part of the exam, just leave a little comment and I'll do a next video to update whatever I missed out, okay? So what are the objectives of these soil maps? So for the experiments, what you'd usually be given is three unknown samples. Of course, you can tell by the way it looks, right? But with science, it's always about proving. It's not just on how it looks. So you want to have the solid proof, right? So you'll get three samples of soil, um, A, B, and C. And you're using these samples here and doing all of these tests to determine what type of soil each one is. So with it, you're going to get the three main types of soils, which is the loom soil, the sandy soil, and the clay soil. And all of these experiments are to try and figure out which is which. And then to do that, you're going to do it based on pH, on sedimentation, um, on water retention and drainage, and also based on the percentage of air that is present in the soil samples. So let's get into it. So the first one is water drainage. So again, um, with this one, I actually put in some numbers because I wanted to show the table and you know some results of how it might or may look. All of these numbers are just made up numbers. And as I explained before, you could do the same. Just make sure your um, the amounts are realistic. You don't want to put too little or you don't want to put too much that is overly exaggerated. So remember, it's something you would do in the lab. So for water drainage, the first thing you want to place a funnel lined with filter paper into a measuring cylinder and do it for all three samples and you're going to label it or the, um, the measuring cylinders. You're going to label it A, B, and C. Now, after that, you add 100 grams of each type of soil to their respective filters, then add 100 milliliters of tap water. After that, we we'll start the timer and leave it for 30 minutes, and then record the volume of water that was collected in each of them. So again, your numbers can change. It doesn't have to be the same as mine. Your time frame could also change, right? Um, but the thing with the time, remember eventually, if you leave it, if you have a small sample and you leave it, let's say for 24 hours, it is expected that at the end of the 24 hours, all of them are going to probably be completely drained and have close to the same amount. So keeping that in mind and the fact that we're trying to see which one drains or in which one of the samples the water will drain the fastest, you want to give it a limited amount of time where you actually see the difference um, in terms of the amount of water that will be collected in the measuring cylinder solely based on the type of soil that the water was passing through. So this here is a diagram. You will have your measuring cylinder. Um, this would be your funnel here. The darker line on the inside is the filter paper, and then you have your soil sample. So in this one, it was just one arm diagram here, but you have three of them, one with sample A, one with sample B, and one with sample C in it. Um, the, fil the purpose of the filter paper is to make sure that the soil stays on the top here and it doesn't get into the measuring cylinder, then that would be defeating the purpose of the experiment. Right? It's just the water we want to come through here. So at the end of this, we should have um, the results. Right, So let me just draw two more. Don't mind that it's smaller. Right? So this one is A. Let's call this one B. And this one will be C. So I'll use the blue for the water, right? So based on the results that we have over here, let's move with that. 
So this is the table. Sometimes um, for your experiments or for the question, they would ask you to, they would give you a space and tell you to um, make a table that you would use to record the data from the experiment that you um, just wrote the procedure for. So for the table, on this side here, you're going to have the amount of water drained through in milliliters. Always remember, please, to put in the units in brackets. Or if you don't want to put it in brackets, you know, sometimes you could just put the slash, right? So either one. So this is the amount of water drained through in milliliters. And this is the amount of water retained in the soil. Right? So how are you going to find how much was retained in the soil? Simply, that is going to be the amount that didn't come through, right? So we know that is why you have to give it the numbers. Yeah, that's why I gave the numbers here. So I put, we are using 100 milliliters of water. And here I have the amount that was collected in the test tube. I'm sorry, not the test tube, the measuring cylinder. So for soil sample A, I have 80, right? So let's say um, here was 80. Then sample B, I had 62. And sample C, I had 49, right? Um, so 80 milliliters, 62 milliliters, and 49 milliliters. That's the amount of water that was collected or passed through or drained through into the measuring cylinder from each type of soil. So how are we going to find the amount of water that remained in the soil? Simple. We are going to use that initial 100 milliliters minus the amount that is in the measuring cylinder. So this here was 100 minus 80. So in the soil, what remained here is 20 milliliters of water um, with soil sample B, 100 minus 62, that will be 38. And 100 minus 49, that will give us 51 milliliters. Now, remember, this is going to be an assumption that this amount actually remained in the soil because, remember, evaporation happens, right? But that's if they ask you, right, um, for what could be maybe like a limitation or something of the experiment. So this one... So with this one, um, that's it. Very simple. The setup is simple. And from this now, we can tell um, the next question is going to be, what do you think each soil type was? So what do you think A was, B was, and C was based on the water drainage or water retention properties that they have? So now you have to recall on your knowledge of loam soil, sand soil, and um, clay soil. We know clay soil holds the most amount of water, right? Um, water doesn't easily drain through. So that means um, the clay soil is going to be one that had the least amount of water collected in the measuring cylinder, and on the flip side, the most amount of water that retained in the soil, was retained in the soil. So that means that is going to be C. Um, C will be the clay soil. Then we know sand soil, water drains through very quickly. So that means that is going to be the one that had the most amount of water collected in the measuring cylinder. And on the flip side, the one that had the least amount of water that retained in the soil. So this one here, which is A, is going to be our sandy soil. And of course, the last one would be the loom soil, right? And loom soil, we know we would find more so in the middle of the results that we would get um, for that of the clay soil and the sand soil. Then 
this one here, the second one. So the percentage of water in the soil or water retention. So again, you have your samples, A, B, and C. And um, I give it the numbers, the values again. So one, you weigh out 100 grams of each type of soil and you place it in labeled beakers. So you have um, A, B, and C. Then two, the, um, you heat the soil on a medium heat until it reaches a maximum temperature of 90 degrees. So if you have to do any heating, then you know um, under your apparatus, you're going to list that you need a some burner and your tripod stand to put it on, um, as well as your thermometer, if we are going to try and get it at this particular, at a particular temperature. Third point, you let the soil cool and then you reweigh it. Right? And after this, you return to the heat for five minute intervals, repeating step three until there is no further loss in weight. And last part, calculate the percentage water in the soil. I don't think I really put water retention here. I'll just leave it as percentage of um, soil, oh, sorry, of water in the soil, right? So we have here the initial weight and the weight at different points. And then you have the final weight. So for this, what you could do with your table, you could set your table up differently from mine. And you can put each time the weight that you got each time you weighed it or you can simply just look at your final weight and your initial weight because those are the two main things that you want to compare so that's what i just put here the initial weight and the final weight and initially all of them were going to have the same weight right because we weighed out a hundred grams of each sample that's going to be something constant you have a hundred grams of each sample then your final weight that is where you're going to see the difference so it's sample a the final weight was 90 sample b 85 sample c um, 60 right and again your units grams so how are you going to calculate the percentage of water that was in the soil? Well, you're using this formula here, which is the percentage is equal to the mass of the wet soil minus the mass of the dry soil divided by the mass of the wet soil. Multiply by 100, and that's how you get it at your percentage. Or that's how you get the percentage. So based on using the formula and the numbers that we have here or the random values that i put here um we would get sample a the percentage of water that was in the soil was 10 sample b the percentage of water 15 and sample c um, the percentage was 40. so based on this here you can also tell what type of soil um, each of the samples would. again the one that had the most amount of water would be um, the clay you know the sand and the loom soil right so you should know um, your properties that's the main thing that you need to know your properties and of course what experiment or what lab setup and procedure you write for those experiments then you have the percentage air in the soil. So one, you punch some um, some small holes in a tin of known volume. So I just put 200 cm cubes in brackets because we're using random numbers again. You pack it with soil. Then, it should have a T in front of it. Then, you plug the holes with plasticine. Two, you add 300 cm cubes of water to a 100 cm cube measuring cylinder 
and then you pour the soil into the water and you still to allow to settle. Now, when you add the soil to the water, it is going to raise um, the point at which the water was going to be at or where the reading was. So if it was here, when you add the soil, it's going to increase. So let's say your new point is here. So this new point, you mark that as X. Then that same initial tin that you had the soil in, you fill that to capacity with water and you pour it into the cylinder and you record the new volume as Y. So after you add your new volume will be here, you mark that as Y. And then you mix vigorously for one minute. So based on this and the measurements that you would get or the readings, you use that to figure out the percentage of air in the soil by using this formula here. So we have the volume of the tin will be Y minus X, right? That's how you find out what was the volume of the, um, the tin that you were using because you didn't know that before. So this, um, that there would be the volume of soil plus air. Right? So x is um, here, we have x is equal to 300. Where did the 300 come from? This here. The 300 cm cubes of water that we initially added. So that would be this water at the bottom here. Right? The initial water in this uh, measuring cylinder. The 300 plus the total volume of the tin minus the volume of air in the soil and in brackets here they have the soil is sorry the air is lost as bubbles now x is equal to 300 plus y minus x so it's like we're plugging in here right because we said the volume of the tin if you didn't know before it was y minus x here 300 x is equal to 300 plus the volume of the tin minus the volume of air in the soil and that is what we have here which is the volume of the tin so you have x is equal to 300 plus y minus x minus the volume of air so therefore the volume of air is equal to 300 plus y minus 2x so it's a whole max thing we're doing here to figure out the percentage of air in the soil. Now, the percentage of air will be equal to 300 plus y minus 2x over y minus x multiplied by the 100 to give you the percentage. So based on the data that we have here, x would be equal to 465 cm3, y would be equal to 765 cm3. And when you plug that in and you work it out, you get the percentage of air in the soil as 45%. So you can pause at this point to try and figure out what madness I am talking here. And luckily, um, from what I have seen in the past papers, I didn't really see anything absent for percentage of air in the soil. Now, this procedure, um, this is usually the one that I would teach for um, biology, and this is the one that I found in some of the lab manuals. So I'm not sure if you're accustomed to doing um, a different procedure. Please remember, any of the procedures that I'm doing here, if you are accustomed to doing something else, that you understand, don't try and swap what you understand for what I am doing here, right? So if this is not the procedure you are accustomed to doing, just disregard everything I am saying here for this one, okay? And I think, well, two more, right? So investigating um, soil composition. So this one I would say is probably the simplest one. Um, 
the first thing you do, you add 100 grams of the soil sample A, B, and C into labeled um, cylinders, measuring cylinders, or here we have some jars, and you add 500 cm cubes of water to each of them. You shake it very vigorously and allow it to settle for 24 hours. And then you come back and you observe and um, make recordings of what you saw. So based on the type of soil that you have, whether it's sand, loam, or clay, it will um, you will be able to see it by the layers of separation that you would find um, after the 24-hour period that you had here. Again, the numbers could be changed, the time could be changed, it's all based on what you want to put. So this one here is explaining exactly what you'll see. And on the bottom here, we have some of what you'd see as well. So with sand soil, we look at this face. So sand soil, what you'll expect is to see very little or no clay, very little silt, and you mainly see sand. Therefore, sand soil. That is why it has the properties that it has, especially when it comes to its water retention, um, and especially with like, the nutrients and all of these things that you would find in it. Also, the acidity, which is the last thing we'll do with the check in for pH. Then you have the loom soil. In the separation, what you'll find here, you'll find about 10 to 30 percent clay, so you'll find a good bit of clay, you'll find a good bit of silt, and you'll also find um, a good bit of sand in it. Now, remember, loom soil is in between, so this is why you'll find high amounts of each type in the loom soil. In the loom soil, you also find a layer of hummus or organic matter, like in this one that they have here, right? So the hummus or humus, however you want to pronounce it, that will be to the very top. And remember, that is all the decaying or the organic matter that you will find in the soil. What it does, it improves the crumb texture of the soil, um, it also releases nutrients slowly into the soil um, when the microorganisms or the decomposers are breaking it down. And then you have the clay soil. Obviously, you are going to find a very large amount of um, clay in it. Clay is very heavy. Um, you also find silt, but maybe not much. You also find sand, right? So, based on the type of soil, you would find different proportions. Sometimes maybe you wouldn't even see some layers or very, very um, indistinguishable layers in the sample. And the last test we have here is the pH. So we're testing for the pH of soil and we could use different things to do this. We can use um, pH strips and compare it to the chart that you will be given for it to see exactly where it lies on the pH scale. Remember, the pH scale runs from 1 to 14, with neutral being 7 in the middle. This side would be your acids, this side would be alkaline. So based on the colors here, it will tell you um, at what level it is. Right, what pH. Um, other than that, we can use litmus paper. We have blue and red litmus paper. We know in um, an acidic solution, blue litmus paper will turn red. With an alkaline solution or a basic solution, red litmus paper will turn blue. So this will just tell us if the solution or, um, that we get from the soil sample is um, acidic or if it is alkaline. It isn't going to give you an actual um, figure or a qualitative, um, sorry, not qualitative, but quantitative data as to where exactly it lies on the pH scale. That's where we use the pH scripts or uh, strips, sorry, or as they have it here, the universal pH paper. So this is the procedure here. So you place 5 grams of each soil sample, A, B, and C, into a small beaker and you add like 10 milliliters of distilled water. Make sure that there's no stones or any um, sticks or anything in it. 
then you mix vigorously and you let it sit for about 10 minutes then you filter to collect the liquid and it's the liquid that you're using to dip if you're using the pH strips or the litmus paper into it and um, if you're using the pH strips you have the chart to compare it to to see exactly where it is so for example here we have um, blue so blue corresponds somewhere here. So this solution is on the alkaline side, right? About 11, um, sort of 12 on this list here. With these samples here, we can see this green tells us from here, it's more around the neutral. So what will we find closer to the neutral side? We will find our loom soil. This one is sort of yellow, so it's on the acidic side, so it's around five. This, and then we have um, sort of red, right? So it's very intense, and that is very, very acidic, right? I want to believe it's somewhere around three, but the way it's looking, maybe because how the poison is holding up in the sun, um, it's given one, but I don't know if it's actually one but we'll just go with one right as that's the color that we're seeing but inside is what i see in this yeah. either way it's acidic right so the green which is more so neutral um or closer to the neutral range that would be considered to be our loom soil and we could identify that as being our loom soil then we have this one in the middle here which is a bit more acidic we would find this mainly being like our clay soils and then we know acidic soils or the most acidic soil would be the sand soil and that is it for soils so with this which was the most con not this one um this one which was the most confusing one again i don't really see this um this so hopefully it doesn't come and if it does, and you are accustomed to doing a next procedure for it, please just grab everything that I said here for this one, okay? So I'm going to discard this, and let's just go right into the questions. We'll do everything in one video. Right. So I didn't have much past papers. Um, so we're just using 2014 and 2015, I believe, 2013, so 2013 and 2014, right? So this year, um, I just picked out the parts that are based on what we'll be doing or what was listed. So part B, a student performs a food test to determine the nutrient content of um, the fruit in figure one. Fruit in figure one was a tomato, right? So complete table one to show the nutrients that are most likely present or absent. So you see, they give you the table, you have the food test, you have the observation, and you have to fill in what nutrient is present or absent based on the type of tests they did and their observation. So the first one, the food test, a drop of iodine solution. So iodine solution is placed on the cut surface of the fruit. Your observation was that it went from the reddish brown to a blue black. So we know that that is a positive test. Iodine is for starch. So what is the nutrient present? Um, is it present or absent? It is starch and it is present. The second one, a small portion of the ripe fruit is squashed and the juice is collected. Two cm cubes of Benedict solution is added and one cm cube of the fruit juice in a test tube. The mixture is heated to boiling over a Bunsen burner for five minutes. Your observation, a red or orange red precipitate is formed in the test tube. We know Benedict's solution, you are testing for 
reducing sugars and the orange red color tells us that it's a positive test so what is the nutrient present reducing sugars and it is present and the last part here three you have two cm cubes of potassium hydroxide plus two drops of copper sulfate solution are added to two cm cubes of fruit juice and the observation no change um, in color is observed so you see what i said you have to know both whether it's a purex um, region or the potassium hydroxide plus the two drops of copper um, sulfate solution right so we know this is the test for proteins no change in color is observed therefore the protein is absent now part c one name the process by which the nutrient identified in food test one is produced in plant um, this is starch starch is stored glucose where does glucose come from photosynthesis um, or how is glucose made through that process of photosynthesis and two Name two nutrients other than those identified in the table that are often present in fruits. So we have a long list that we can um, put that is present in fruits, but I just put three here. So we have like potassium, we have vitamin C or ascorbic acid, and we have um, dietary fiber as well. And that was all that was based on um, the food test here. Then in 2013, um, we had a mix of both of them in this one question. So question one, in Caribbean countries, many householders um, use a variety of fruits and vegetables in their diet. So figure one shows a tray containing some fruits. So the first thing to measure the diameter, you, you have done that with your ruler. B, a cross section of each fruit is placed in a petri dish. A few drops of iodine solution are placed on each fruit. So write us what will aim for this experiment. So remember with your aim, your aim always starts with some keywords to determine, to investigate. Um, those are two of the most common ones to analyze all of these different things, but there are keywords that it always starts with. So simply, um, you can put it's just one mark, so nothing hard. You know, iodine we're tested for starch. So what is your aim to determine which fruits contain starch, or to determine if the fruits contain starch? All right. So you can word it any way you want, but basically that's the idea of what it is. Then part two: construct an appropriate table to record the results of the um, activity in B one. So you have fruits, which is your tomatoes, grapes, and your banana. And is your observation on the next side. You can put observation or you can put color change, yes or no. Three marks. Then I think no, almost the last part. Right. So in part three. The following observations are made with the iodine solution. So the banana turned blue-black in color, the tomato, no color change, the grape, no color change. So what scientific conclusions can be made from these observations? So you can put anything again, it does not have to be worded like I am wording mine here, but you can put that it um, can be concluded that only the banana contains starch, Right? Because from the results that is what we are seeing, only the banana turned blue black. Um, or it could be concluded that in our next way we can write it, um, that the banana has a high concentration or a high starch content, while the grapes and the tomatoes um, don't have a high content of the starch stored in them. Then part C, one. Plan and design an experiment to show which of two soil types is more suitable for growing large tomatoes. So what's your hypothesis? Remember your hypothesis is an educated guess that you make, a statement that you put forward based on um, the theory that you would have. 
and then your experiment now um, that you are designing would be circulating or revolving around figuring out whether your hypothesis is true or whether it is not. So if we're testing two soil types here to figure out which one is more suitable for growing large tomatoes, we can simply put the tomatoes will grow larger in loom soil compared to clay soil. And on top I put soil A and soil B because when I came down here, I saw they had soil A and soil B. They didn't actually have like two names that they were given. Right, so that's why I put that on top here. Then your variables. So remember, you always have independent and dependent variables. Your independent variable would be the type of soil that you are using. And what is going to be dependent on the type of soil that you are using? The size of the tomatoes that are being produced. Then state one limitation of the investigation. So just for one mark, it could be anything, right? So you think about something that could limit the possibilities of um, this experiment turning out the way you think it should. So the soil, we already know that that is changed up and we expect that in different types of soil, you find um, different um, concentrations of particular nutrients. It will also have different um, water holding quantity or qualities as we saw in those um, soil experiments. So all of that where the soil is expected. We would most likely put it in the same place. Um, you put the same amount of soil, you put it in at the same time, everything. So what I was thinking, the only thing that could be a limitation is the seed itself, right? So you see if something could be wrong with it or it could be defective or if we're getting it from a package most likely the package is going to state that you know all of the seeds were collected from the same plant or something and you have to remember that all the time all of the seeds would um be the same or have the same characteristics it could be because of cross pollination it could be because of some um, the generative problem itself with the seed, right? So that's why I just put um, the problem or the limitation being the seed. But if you could think of anything else, you um, and get a question like this, you write that, okay? Then part two, table one shows the results of the investigation in C1. So we have the readings, one, two, three, four, and five. And you have the mass of tomato in soil A in grams. So you see they put their units there. You can always make sure you do that. And the mass of tomato in soil B, again, in grams. So they listed it. And then you have the average. And they listed this one here. The first thing you had to do was calculate the average mass of tomatoes grown in soil B. Very easy to mass here. You know your average. You add up all and then you divide. Right, so it's 140, 150, 160, 145, and 155. You add that up and then divide it by 5. You get 150, and that's going to be 150 grams. And the last part is to write a suitable conclusion based on the results in table 1. So, based on the results, um, I wrote that it can be concluded that the soil B is the best soil for growing large tomatoes. One month. So simple enough, um, I wasn't able to get any more questions or um, question papers and those are, I think I have up to 2016 and I looked through I think 20, 2005 to 2016 and this was like the main soil question that I saw, right? So just remember, um, if you are asked about soil, just recall your labs. They are very simple, right? Remember what you have to do. Remember, especially if it's the water retention or the water drainage. Very simple experiments to do. So just remember the apparatus that you have to use. Um, remember to put your 
values so just make up something that is realistic and uh, yeah you should be good to go for your um, food test remember the only one that needs to do any sort of boiling or anything intricate is the first one um, which we spoke about which is the Bendix test remember your procedures for it remember um, the results that you would get if it's a positive or a negative test and what you are testing for whether it's reducing major, um, reducing sugars, um, starch, lipids, or proteins, all right? So I do hope um, that this video was helpful. Um, again, as I said, I didn't have the actual labs for this. So if I missed out anything or I explained something differently than you have done um, for integrating science, just shoot me a message or a little comment underneath in the um, comment area and I will do an update video before the exam. I think you will tell me it's Thursday, right? So I'll change up anything or add in anything new. You just let me know and uh, yeah. So best of luck with your exams and I hope everything goes smoothly.